right, we'll go and get started. Um, so my name is Alex Plotsky, uh, and I hope uh, I run the data science meetup. Um, basically, as it kind of name suggests, we're all about data science, so whatever that means. Basically, from business intelligence to more science tech topics. Hey, guys. Um, and so that's kind of what we're all about. Um, so we meet here every third Thursday of every month. On the first Thursday of every month in this building, at the same time as Max Pi meetup for Python. So every couple, couple of weeks, there's a really cool meetup going on here that you get a chance to see. Uh, this building, by the way, is a technology cooperative. They're a nonprofit that generally does uh, STEM programs for after school uh, here at East Knoxville. Um, so what we're going to actually have is um, next month we actually won't have a meetup. Um, the reason for that is um, soon to be announced, um, Knox Devs, which is kind of this umbrella group for all the software developer groups here in Knoxville. Uh, we're actually organizing a large, a large quarterly slash bigger meetup, about 900 people, um, with the city and with the mayor. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, talking about open data because open data is a project started uh, in Knoxville last year. Uh, finally, Knoxville is part of the kind of growing consensus city is doing this kind of thing, and so. Uh, we're going to have more details here soon, but it will be the last Thursday of June, so June 28th. Uh, more details come out that soon, but uh, it's close enough to the Knox Data Journal Time Meetup, so we won't have a meetup, so you can go to that. Uh, it's really, really exciting. Like I said, more details come out soon. You can find out more if you go to the Knox Devs, uh, meetup.com slash Knox Devs. Uh, find out more about that. The meetup after? Uh, yeah. yeah. One more thing. So about the uh, the Knox data and open science stuff. There was a really good talk at the end of PyCon. I can put, I can send it to you. But this lady lists the like twenty organizations that do open data and like where we can list our open data and cool make it. So there are a lot of good ways to get started. Uh, so yeah, keep in mind. Uh, but our next meetup for Knox data will be actually uh, in two in two months. Uh, one about deep reinforced learning. Um, Zach Kimball is not here tonight. Uh, he's actually gave a really cool demo uh, on training a computer to basically play Atari style games, uh, which was actually the subject of a Nature article three years ago. Um, so it's going to be kind of cool. Uh, I've been uh, getting on him for a while to give a, give a talk, so it should be really cool. So, But it won't be as cool, though. Is this, is this talk? <laughs> so, without further ado, I'll let Nikhil go ahead and get started. Uh, talk about machine uh, learning. Okay, thanks, Alex, for the introduction and also for organizing this meetup series. Uh, my name is Nikhil, um, and I'm a data scientist. Uh, but in my past life, I was a neuroscientist. Um, so that's kind of where the inspiration for this talk came from. I've met a lot of people sort of professionally in the data science world who are practicing deep learning, machine learning, um, computer vision. Um, but um, I found that like, while talking to them, um, they really haven't uh, thought about what a, what a neuron actually is and, and from the biology side. And I, I thought, well, uh, this is a good opportunity to kind of share um, kind of my previous expertise uh, with the sort of broader group. Um, and so um, the, the goal of this talk is twofold. Um, one is kind of a brief historical overview of artificial neural nets. Um, and then um, the second half is a little bit more about um, kind of biologically inspired solutions to some of the problems that you might face if you're trying to use neural networks. Um, and so this, uh, I guess we'll start here. This is a neuron, it's a micrograph. Um, that black uh, thing in the middle is the cell body of the neuron. It's about 30 micrometers uh, wide. Um, and the reason you're able to see it so clearly here um, is because of an advance in technology made around 1900 called the Golgi stain. And what that does is, um, you know, this is a big piece of brain tissue. There's actually probably um, thousands or, or tens of thousands of neurons just in this, um, in this picture here. But you can't see them because they're all kind of tangled together, interspersed. Um, it's this big sort of dense jelly. Um, and what the Golgi stain does is it randomly selects like one out of every thousand cells and makes the term deep black. And so when you look at it under a microscope, you can finally see kind of all the fine cellular processes that are going on. And so um, in terms of structure, uh, neurons have kind of three basic parts. 
There's the cell body, which I pointed out in the middle. Um, there are these fine filaments that lead into um, the, the cell body, those are the dendrites um, when they make neurons. Um, and then there's this big, thick process coming up, um, and that's the axon or the output. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's really inputs, processing, output. And so these are the two people responsible for um, discovering that staining procedure. They won the um, Nobel Prize in 1906 in physiology and medicine. Uh, so Camilo Golgi on the left, the, the process is named after him. And then Santiago Ramoni Cajal, a uh, Spanish guy on the right. Um, and he was famous for um, doing uh, these sort of very, very detailed drawings of various parts of the nervous system. So on the left there um, is actually a cross section of the retina. Um, and if you closely scan it, you see like a random subset of cells and that's uh, kind of what's, what's uh, drawn there. And on the right here um, is a piece of sort of the cortex of the brain. So, um, you know, and, and again, um, I, I, I guess uh, the takeaway here is that um, neurons are very complicated in their structure. Um, and up until this point, um, people weren't really able to um, you know, they didn't really know um, whether um, neurons in the brain were continuous, as in it was all just one big extended piece of jelly, or whether they're actually discrete. And because of the staining method, they actually discover that neurons are discrete and they're, they're adjacent to each other, but they're not actually connected to each other. Um, and so this was really important in our understanding of the brain because we can now think of the neurons like the fundamental unit of processing um, in the brain. Um, and so here's another image. This is a uh, sagittal cross section. So sagittal just means if you look at the side of my head, you take a slice this way um, and put it on a microscope. This is actually a mouse brain. Uh, and if you look at um, this section here where my mouse is, this is kind of this curve. Just remember the shape in your mind as I flip to the next slide. Um, so this is a, a Golgi stain section. It doesn't look like much right to it. Um, you can actually see all this sort of fine structure emerge. Um, and so it's not just about individual neurons as the fundamental unit of computation, but these very dense networks of neurons connected to each other um, and the information that kind of flows into um, the network and, and uh, is computed and the outputs that, that emerge. Um, similarly, um, you know, it's not just about what the neurons look like. Um, neurons are also serve a sort of function. Um, they're electrically active cells. Um, and so if you, for example, this uh, image here on the left um, is a fly, like a house fly that you would, you would find buzzing around. Um, and if you cut out a tiny piece of the cuticle above its uh, eye, you can actually stick a metal electrode into the brain. Um, and so uh, what you see up here are recordings taken from a fly that's um, well, not actually in flight, but kind of simulation of flight where, you know, its, it's wings are beating or not, and then the world kind of moves past it. Um, and uh, you can see that this neuron is more active during flight than uh, not. And um, you probably don't want to get too much into the function of, like, the fly, fly visual system. But for the purposes of this talk, what's interesting to note is that, um, you know, these neurons have these, like, very discrete electrical signals in time. So the output of a neuron is like, you know, one to two milliseconds, very sort of uh, binary. Um, and so, um, you know, you can generally think of what is the computation that the neuron is doing as integrating all of the inputs on its dendrites and coming to kind of a binary decision of like yes or no. Um, and that's represented by this like spike in time. Um, and so, um, you know, when you think about how to model neurons, um, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's biology, it's complicated. There's bids um, and proteins and membranes and, and bilayers, ion channels, neurotransmitters. Um, and, you know, this, this here in this diagram, uh, you know, there's several cells that are connected to this one neuron sending inputs onto its dendrites. Um, and it becomes mathematically intractable to really model all those biological processes. And so what um, scientists tried to do is to like simplify what neurons or to how they describe neurons. Um, so instead of trying to capture all of the biological detail, um, they kind of came up with this cartoon representation of, of a neuron here on the, on the right. Um, so the, you get these inputs, they're kind of discrete in time, um, and every input produces some sort of response. Um, and when the sum of the responses exceeds a threshold, then the, the neuron will fire. Um, 
Um, and so in 1943, um, McCulloch and Pitts kind of wrote down the first sort of formal um, equation to describe this process. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, you know, you have a number of inputs here with weights. Um, the weight just represents the strength of that input, so like a, you know, a strong weight from input one means it produces a very large response in the neuron. Um, and then they're summed together and put through this sort of threshold function, are they above or below the threshold of the neuron? You get this output. Um, and for all you coders out there, this is what it would look like to implement a neuron in Python. Um, so, you know, you take the sum of the inputs and the weights, you add a bias term, um, and then if this output is the firing rate, um, and it's just a, it's not quite a linear threshold, but you essentially say, like, is it above um, this, this, uh, this threshold here? Um, and what's cool about this is you can, if you think about it, um, you can actually implement kind of logical operations using um, just this basic computational setting. Um, so, for example, like the AND um, would mean you'd have sort of two sub-threshold inputs that combine to produce uh, a, a, a super-threshold response. Um, and OR means like, you know, you have um, individual inputs that are strong enough to drive the cell to fire on their own. Um, and not, um, you know, these, these weights don't necessarily have to be positive, they can also be negative. Um, so you can implement a NOT gate by adding some sort of inhibitory input or, or something that's suppressing the response or um, driving uh, the neuron to lower states of activity. Um, and so because you can, uh, you know, think of these as like analog circuits, um, you can actually build them at, using analog circuits, which is what this Frank Rosenblatt did in 1958. Um, so this is his uh, machine. He calls it the Mark I Perceptron. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's kind of got a, a structure. you kind of simplify it, like, it looks like this. Um, there's an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Um, and so the kinds of computations you can do, like, let's say, for example, you wanted to know whether an uh, unknown animal was a dog or a cat. Um, you can quantify um, a number of different dimensions about that animal, um, such as its size, its how trainable or domestic it is, the number of teeth, um, and sort of feed those in to individual um, input neurons. Um, you know, you uh, apply uh, some weights, and um, at the end, you can say, oh, is it a dog or a cat? Um, and, and really, the key to perceptrons is that you have to adjust the weights so that you produce the desired output. Um, and so the way you do that is, um, you know, you can start by adding examples. Um, so here you have two examples of a dog and a cat. Um, and then the linear line represents kind of the decision function of the perceptron. Um, and as you add examples, the weights change. Um, so, let's see. Um, you know, if the output is correct, um, you don't really, whoops, um, you don't really do anything to the weights. If the output, like let's say dog is one and cat is minus one, and if the output for what you know as a dog is too low, you can increase the weights for all the neurons that are active. And if the output for um, the desired class is too high, then you can lower the weights for the neurons that are active when you give it a new example. Um, and so that's kind of how you train it. You add examples, show it many more examples. It's kind of a supervised learning paradigm. Um, and this is like uh, equivalent to like a one layer neural network. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, I apologize if I'm going fast. Feel free to interrupt me with questions as they come up. This is meant to be kind of more of an informal discussion. So, um, you know, please, please raise your hand or just interject um, if, if you have questions. Um, and so, um, you know, this is the uh, sort of single layer uh, perceptron here on the left. Um, and you can start to classify more complicated types of things um, by adding hidden layers. And so this is what is mean, what is meant when people are saying like deep learning. Well, what 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 is what is, what dimension um, is deep? And so it's this the number of hidden layers. Like uh, uh, you know, now for image classification, people are using networks that have fourteen layers, sixteen layers, one hundred fifty layers. Um, and so that's that's what's meant by the depth of the neural network. Uh, and so this this one, which is pretty simple with two hidden layers, is what we call a, a multi-layer perceptron. Yeah. I just I have a question about is there any logic or like reasoning as to like how many hidden layers you need, um, or is it just kind of so there's a trade-off. Uh, the more layers 
add, the more flexible kind of your decision boundary can be. Um, but the downside, which I'm about to talk about, is um, it's much, much harder to train. Um, so you can't do the same exercise that you could for a single layer where you know kind of which weights to adjust. Once you have several layers stacked on each other, you don't know whether to adjust the weight of, of this neuron or this neuron, right? If you know if it's wrong, like which one do you raise or lower? Um, sometimes maybe you need to raise one and lower the other. Um, and so this leads to kind of a, a um, famous kind of, uh, oops, oh yeah, sorry, before I get to that. Um, so this is how you would uh, essentially write down um, the code for a three-layer neural network. Um, and here, these Ws are matrices of weights. So W1, W2, and W3 represent kind of uh, a three by four matrix. Um, and so you just do uh, the dot product of that. It's, I guess, so a sum of all the activations, essentially. Uh, and then you just propagate that down. So the inputs to uh, layer two are the outputs of layer one. Um, and I keep going. But uh, to train something that has many, many layers, it's very deep. It's actually um, kind of difficult, again, because you don't know which weights need to be adjusted to reach your desired output. Um, and so um, this is uh, kind of the famous backpropagation algorithm that was developed to train these neural networks. Um, and so uh, essentially, I, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the math, but what you're doing is um, you, know, you say you have a desired output y. Um, and you want to know how much of the error in your computed Y for a new example um, it belongs to each of these neurons in the chain. Um, and so you can apply um, a trick from calculus known as the chain rule um, and essentially take uh, the derivative of the error with respect to each of these um, kind of neuronal activations in this chain. Um, and then uh, you compute the fraction of the error that belongs to each of them, and then uh, update the weights accordingly. And so that way you can propagate the error backwards through the network and adjust the weights appropriately to give you something that's closer to the desired output. Um, and so generally, the deeper the neural networks are, the longer they take to train, because you have to run this um, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of iterations to get it to converge to something stable that works for all of your input examples. So, so that's the big downside to having you know arbitrarily deep networks is like you'll run out of you know GPU time on your machine. Or so it's just like cursive dimensionality. Cursive dimensionality, exactly. So like the state of the art image classifiers have like you know one, two, three million parameters, um, which are weights. Uh, and again, um, for those of you who like to read code, this is the back propagation algorithm in code. Uh, again, I'll share this, this presentation so that I can take a note or anything like that. Uh, but really, it's, it's just using kind of the Eulerian method for derivatives to give you an update and then you can incrementally update the weights, propagate that through, and then keep going. Um, so, uh, just to summarize kind of uh, artificial versus biological neurons. So, artificial neurons in, in the neural nets that we sort of work with today uh, generally have somewhere in the order of tens to hundreds of inputs per neuron um, or synapses. Um, the neural functions themselves are relatively simple, so it's just the sum of the inputs and some threshold. Um, in fact, they, they started out using these like sigmoidal curves for activation, um, but those become computationally difficult when you're doing really, really deep networks. Um, so they actually simplified them to linear units that basically um, throw away any input that's negative and just give you um, the exact sum of the inputs as output if it's positive. Um, so those are called uh, rectified linear units. And if, you, if you're reading anything about deep learning, you'll see that term pop up. Um, you know, they, uh, artificial neural networks don't have dendrites, um, and they learn by this backpropagation algorithm. Um, in contrast, you know, biological neurons, um, the cells will often receive thousands of inputs. Um, and the dendrites themselves, the process, sorry, the question. So, so you mentioned the federal big drive that they learn by so how, how do we uh, learn? How do, you, uh, how do we learn? How do we learn? Yeah. Still ongoing uh, research there. It's, it's a complicated question, um, but basically the idea is you know you have synapses between neurons, um, and it's not just purely electrical input. It's uh, it's near, it's uh, electrochemical. 
So the electrical signal at the end of the axon causes a release of neurotransmitter that causes uh, better, you know, is received by all the downstream cells. <coughs> they um, convert that into electrical activity. And so um, you learn by changing the weights of your synapses, but it's not by propagating the error all the way back through the chain. Um, there's some other sort of um, so learning the rule. The electric signals like so there, there's a um, uh, famous saying from 1949, this guy Donald Hammond, um, who also won the Nobel Prize. Um, he, he says, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, and so that's, that's essentially like how brains learn in a nutshell. It's, it's um, about the, the relative timing of neurons. Um, and then the mechanism of it is like, you know, you actually add uh, uh, proteins and ion channels and things to the actual synapse. So there's actual physical structural changes in the brain that cause that response to be greater or lower the next time electrical uh, impulse hits it. So it's those changes. There's many different time scales, so you can learn, you know, um, you, neurons can learn over, over like seconds or minutes or hours, and each of those has a different mechanism. So the inputs to neurons are these dendrites are actually active, and they can process or shape the signal. So it's not just the sum of the inputs. Uh, and then uh, synapses are, as we just talked about, they're unidirectional. So it's not like you can pass an error signal backwards along the synapse. The, the signal kind of just feeds forward to the network. Um, and if there's feedback, it's through recurrent loops where you know cell B will come back and make a connection back onto cell A, not because the signal goes the other way. So, the signal processing in neurons is, is generally unidirectional. <coughs> and the learning happens by you know, adjusting the weights of the, sy of the synapses themselves through uh, biophysical processes, or just growing new synapses or new pieces of the cell. Yeah? So when you said um, that there are thousands versus tens to hundreds, is that like the width of the... It's the number of inputs that a single cell would get. OK. What would the depth look like for the power? So I can't, I mean, I don't know what the hierarchical structure looks like. I don't think any of it, well, I have a slide about that. Okay. Um, but um, just to give you a sense of scale, um, you have um, something like 10 billion neurons, um, which is uh, I think, um, 10 to the 13 synapses. Um, so it's, it's a lot. Um, and um, yeah, so you're asking about the hierarchy. What does it look like in the brain? This is highly, highly simplified. So, you know, the brain does this task of image classification where you can show it a picture and you 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 know like what what it is in that picture. So here, you know, it's it's obviously a cat. Yeah. Have you ever heard of blind sight? Uh, yes. Where the first processing is connected has to the high processing of what you see uh, right, you're not you're not aware of your perception, but some part of your brain knows it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that applies to just regular perception. Our genes. I mean, you think that they'll be able to skip uh, various layers once they come up beyond? I don't think it's that they're skipping layers. I think in order to have blind sight, the entire visual stream needs to be intact. Um, what's missing is kind of these. You know, the, you notice this visual stream here is only in this area of the brain. Um, and the part of the brain that's, that's uh, modulating your attention and awareness and your, you know, consciousness, to use that word, um, is, is generally like, you know, more of the prefrontal cortex. And so I think what's missing is that kind of attention or awareness that you've seen something, even though the signal is available um, in the rest of the visual, visual cortex. Um, so you can query it in different ways, and that's how they do these clever experiments where they try to tease out whether the person actually saw something or not. Um, but I think you need an intact visual stream to even get it. <laughs> so is that how you applying that to the algorithm so far? Uh, no. no. It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so, you know, the brain, uh, the visual stream starts with the retina, um, and it goes through all these different regions, and it's kind of this hierarchical structure. Um, and, you know, each of these regions has tens of thousands or millions of neurons. Uh, but to simplify it, you know, we, we like to think about them as like these like, you know, two-dimensional matrices. Um, but in reality, they're actually like big interspersed volumes. Um, and they're not all doing the same operation. So, um, you know, uh, 
the I guess the, the takeaway here is is um, it's kind of this hierarchical processing where uh, you know the signal is transformed and then transformed again and again and again and again. At the end, you get from a um, sort of pattern of light and dark um, to the representation or perception of a cat. Um, and so um, you can kind of do this with with artificial neural networks as well. Um, so up until now, we've looked at kind of these two-dimensional ones. Um, and really, the key idea of this is that this circle region here um, maps to a specific uh, region in visual space. Um, so the, the, these neurons in the center here only look at the center of the image. Um, and so that's called a receptive field. It means that the neuron there is only receptive to inputs in that part of the visual field. Um, and so those, that sort of spatial organization <coughs> is conserved throughout. And so, um, you know, one of the insights of convolutional networks is that if you preserve that spatial structure of the input image, um, you can actually perform reasonably well on these image classification tasks. Um, and so, you know, instead of this sort of two-dimensional flat neural network here, you start with a, an input volume. This is like your RGB image, so you could have like three channels, red, green, and blue. Um, and then if you look at a region in visual space here, that maps onto these five neurons in the next volume. And then those neurons map onto the next, you know, sort of column of neurons in the next volume. Um, and so it preserves the spatial organization. Um, so this, this is, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around because humans are not very good at visualizing things in three dimensions. Um, so here's an example of like what the activations look like. Um, so you have a, a Tesla here on the left. Um, and here's the output of the convolution. So each, each square here represents a neuron. Um, so there's a subset of neurons from this thing, and you can see uh, it's kind of picking up, um, I guess you'd call them the edges of the car. So it's transforming this sort of pattern of light and dark pixels into edges. Um, and then the, the, the nonlinearity kind of thresholds that, right? So you're only getting um, edges that are above a certain sort of base value, and that provides your feature um, to the next layer. Um, and so um, the next layer um, does the same operation again, finds the edges in those features from the first layer, thresholds them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to this last layer here, um, where you essentially get these like very large holes because um, you know they're they're with this pool. What that means is you're taking a group of like uh, nine or twelve or whatever pixels and just uh, averaging them. Um, so your representation gets coarser and coarser as you go along. Um, until the last layer, you have something like, like this, where there's you know, 16 different options. And those are your 16 different classes that you've trained for your classifier. Uh, and so then the one that activates the most here is this one on the left. And that's the one that's the car. Um, and so um, you know, this, is, this is kind of. I, I find that it helps to visualize what the um, what the output of each layer is to kind of understand what these networks are doing. Um, <coughs> you know, people do this in the brain too, um, using electrodes and stimuli and making flash patterns of light and try to measure like what an individual brain cell is responding to. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at the visual cortex, it's kind of the first part of the brain that, that gets your um, input signal from the retina, um, and you measure the responses or the receptive fields of those cells. Um, they look like this. So they have these patterns of like angled uh, light and dark um, or stripes like this. Um, and if you look at um, kind of the uh, receptive field maps for the first layer of the neural network, so what is the, what is the if you look at what the weights end up being after it converges, um, you kind of get the same features here. Um, so I thought that's kind of an interesting coincidence. Uh, and then layer two is kind of like the sum of these things, uh, which is what you would find in visual cortex two. Uh, and so uh, this is all well and good, but if you want to start solving harder problems than is it a cat or a dog in the image, um, you know, there's this uh, image net competition that happens every year. Um, and generally they give computer vision researchers problems like classification, which is like here are a thousand different categories, can you sort them, sort them out based on the image, or localization, which is where you draw a box around an object, or segmentation, which is where you define which pixel in the image belongs to an object. Um, these are much, much harder. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the sort of canonical feed-forward convolutional network 
it doesn't always work very well in these cases. Um, and so I think um, you know, as people try to solve these problems, um, you know, instead of just brute forcing it and adding more layers and trying to throw more com computer power at it, they had to make uh, sort of more clever solutions um, because they were running into the limits of uh, computational electricity and money. Um, and so here um, is a representation of the visual system kind of as a block diagram. Um, so it's similar to what we saw before, um, the simplified version. Right? So there's a hierarchy. Um, uh, but what this is showing you is that actually it's, it's more than just a, a sort of um, simple linear hierarchy. There's actually nested loops and, and interconnectedness. Um, so you know, here's the retina. Um, here's the first step. Here's the here's visual cortex one, V two, um, and there's a lot of this like recurrent connectivity happening happening at later layers. Um, and so I think uh, the the practitioners um, who were building artificial neural networks to solve visual tasks um, decided to um, make replicate some of that hierarchy and see if that improved the performance. And it turns out it does. So a group at Google. Um, did what they called a network in network, um, where instead each you know each circle in these diagrams um, doesn't represent a neuron anymore. It actually represents um, an entire neural network, um, and so they're nesting neural networks within a larger neural network, if that makes sense. Um, and so that's that's closer to the way the brain actually does it. Um, and they found that they got um, kind of an, uh, a huge bump in performance from, from uh, doing it this way. Um, and so the individual neural networks that they use as these subunits are relatively simple. Um, you know, it's like a one by one convolution or a one by n convolution, which are relatively small, fewer parameters. So the total network itself actually has the same number of parameters. It's just the way that they're connected is different. They're kind of more nested. Um, and that gives you uh, better performance at the end. Um, and they also call those capsule networks. Is that cap true? capsule networks are similar, uh, similar, similar idea. Yeah, there's there's many different ways to implement that idea. This is just one example. Yeah. Is there a particular strategy for deciding these um, sub networks or, or like are they and error? Really? Yeah. Okay. But are they attempting to make networks? Are they attempting to kind of break down the problem? Like have a small network that recognizes this and smaller network. Uh, well, so you can visualize the features that come out of each layer, and you can make sort of informed guesses about what, what are good features versus bad features. Or like, you can even do something like measure the entropy, you know, and something that has a lot of variance um, is going to be a really rich feature that your classifier can then pick up on. So if you wanted to do something like, you know, more, more um, sort of principled, you could like maximize the entropy of the features in each layer or something like that. Right. Um, um, and so uh, one of the problems with the backpropagation algorithm is that um, you know it's it's not guaranteed to find the global minimum. Um, so you can kind of get stuck sometimes um, at the local minima. Um, or worse, you know, you don't have an energy landscape that looks like this, you have something that's more flat, um, and your your gradient can vanish to zero. And so your learning al algorithm kind of gets stuck and never really converges. Um, and this is very, very common for networks beyond like you know, 10, 10 layers. Uh, so uh, one of the ways to solve this, um, so this is a this is a uh, electric eagle. Um, they have these little pits located along the side of their bodies, um, and it's actually part of their um, there's a sixth sense that they have where they can use electric currents to uh, map out the world around them. So they live in these like murky waters. They don't have very good vision. They don't often know like what's around them, so this is like their version of like radar to get a sense of like what are the objects around. Um, so Electrolocation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how does this work? Well, they they send a pulse of electricity into the water and they measure what comes back. Um, and if there's an object in the way, uh, they'll be able to sense that. Um, and so, if you try to draw like a block diagram of how this works in biology. Uh, there's the motor command, which is their electric discharge organ, sends it to the cell that send out the burst of electricity. Uh, there's a sensory system that receives that. Um, but the brain of these animals also sends a copy of that motor command signal uh, to a different part of the brain. And that part of the brain compares what it's getting from the outside world um, with what it expects 
So it's the sensory expectation. And that's actually you know, coming from the nervous system itself. Um, and so what it's actually measuring is this discrepancy. And so the reason it does this is because the signals that it gets, electrical, uh, electric uh, fields kind of drop off as a square of distance. They're really, you know, it's, all, it's not sending that much current out into the water, otherwise it would kill itself. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, they're very, very weak signals. And so this sort of compar comparison method allows it to pick up um, and amplify signal in this noisy environment. Um, and so uh, why am I talking about electric fish and I'm talking about neural networks? Um, well, uh, some, some people decided that this is this, this strategy of um, passing forward kind of the signal itself and subtracting it, um, you know, where you, you take the residual um, and, and do this operation can actually um, solve the vanishing gradient, gradient problems for deep networks. Um, so instead of encoding like the raw activation of each neuron, you're activating, you're, you're, um, you're sending forward the deltas between the activation and the previous layer. Um, and so that allows the gradient to um, not vanish as quickly. And so with this trick, uh, so again, this is like, you know, a zoomed in part of a much larger neural network. Um, if you want to see more about this, there's a paper, um, it's called ResNet. Um, but uh, the general idea is like you can now train networks that have 150 layers. Um, so you can get 8x deeper um, by using this trick. Um, so, uh, and then um, the kind of the last biological example I'm going to talk about is um, synaptic plasticity. Uh, so this goes back to your question about how do we learn. Um, so synapses kind of change their strength. Um, and they change their strength on multiple time scales. Um, and so um, one of the things that happens in the brain is that the timing of when signals um, reach a, a given neuron um, affects whether that uh, weight is strengthened or not. Um, and so if you look at these, this diagram here, um, you know, spike here precedes this one, so this synapse should strengthen. This spike here precedes this one, so this synapse should weaken. Um, and you can express that as this learning rule here where, you know, this is the x-axis and this is the synaptic strain. So if, um, you know, the, the, spike, the spike happens 100 milliseconds before, you get something weak. If it happens really close in time, you get a much stronger weight. Um, similarly, if it happens right before, um, you get a uh, very large decrease. And if it happens, like, a long time before, you get less decrease. Um, and so... Um, you can add this kind of faster timescale plasticity to deep neural networks. Um, this is kind of the activation equation for a given neuron, and they're adding this term in red, which is kind of this faster uh, uh, sort of synaptic plasticity term. Um, so this is actually a paper out of Uber's research group, um, and the task that they're showing it, or they're trying to solve here is um, actually um, given a sequence of images um, can it learn something about the sequence of images that when they test it with an incomplete version of something it's seen before, um, that it can reconstruct or, or complete um, that, that um, uh, image? So, you know, you show these three, you give this as the test pattern, and it should reconstruct this image. Similarly, you show it these three, um, you give it this, and it should reconstruct this image. Um, so this is just like a kind of toy example of the task. The actual task involves thousands and thousands of images. Um, it's actually pretty difficult. You can't solve it with your your ResNet or like um, state of the art feed forward neural network. Um, and so it turns out that by adding this um, this plasticity term, um, you can actually uh, add sort of enough memory or, or hysteresis in the in the changing of the weights themselves um, to give you the desired outcome. So in summary. Um, you know, what, what, uh, what is machine learning taken from biology? Um, I'm showing you these three examples. One is this natural network, so you can improve the kind of the accuracy of classification with nested hierarchies. Um, there's also the residuals, uh, so you can train deeper and wider networks by encoding the deltas um, between the activation as opposed to, and the previous layer, as opposed to just the activations themselves, um, and plasticity. Uh, which is kind of simple meta-learning or learning about the process of learning itself through kind of online faster timescale adaptation. Uh, there's a lot more. Um, deep learning um, is a very rich field. 
Um, there are a lot of different things. Like next month's talk is going to be about reinforcement learning. Um, that's kind of loosely inspired by the dopamine system in the brain. I didn't talk about that. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff, um, like associative memory by John Hopfield. Um, you know, long short-term memory, LSTMs. This is another type of neuron that people use in neural networks. Um, and so a lot of these have biological origins. Um, and so I guess in conclusion, um, oops, um, you know, the, uh, if, if you're ever working on this kind of problem and you get stuck, uh, maybe turn to biology and see, uh, <laughs> see what solutions might arise. And uh, just to, uh, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of hype in the news and if you read um, you know, tech blogs and stuff, people are worried about super intelligent AI coming to get us. And I'm not really worried. Uh, the reason I'm not worried yet um, is because of the simple benchmarking. Um, so there was a, a famous um, Go match, um, Go is a board game, uh, between uh, master Go player Lee Sedol from Korea and uh, AlphaGo, which is Google's deep mind, this kind of AI Go playing uh, bot. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at just power consumption, um, AlphaGo was running on 1920 GPUs, 200, 1920 CPUs, 280 GPUs. Um, you know, just some background of <coughs> math um, comes out to around 200 kilowatts of power. For just the, the, you know, the compute itself, not counting all the cooling and infrastructure being invested. Uh, and so, <coughs> you know, his brain invented about 20 watts. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, the rest of them is 80 watts, 100 watts. So it's about five orders of magnitude. So, you know, super intelligent AI is going to run out of power. Uh, so I think we'll be okay at least for the near term. Uh, Learns much faster. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, for now, also that's that's very tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, so they, they, yes, that's true. It's for training, but they actually use that same machine uh, to play some matches. And I think when they did the, the exhibition matches, at all, well, they had, like miniaturize the network and run it on their TPUs. Um, but it's still <coughs> more power. Um, so. I mean, it's, it's a server rack instead of a server room. Uh, questions? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm curious what you know about, um, I guess, this might be similar to the question I asked before, but like, can you have these intermediate layers? Um, I mean, what, I guess, what's the prevailing um, Practice, I guess, strategy, the prevailing strategies for how to form those intermediate layers. Because um, I mean, I know, I understand like the input is an image and the output is something that kind of identifies the classification. But what, what, how, how do you go about, I guess, deciding what to put in the intermediate layers? Um, generally, um, what I've seen done is people start with something that gets close. Um, this is a pretty, uh, I guess, popular field these days, and so a lot of people are, are working on similar problems. And so generally, you're not trying to come up with a solution from scratch. You're actually modifying the solution before, and then you can go through this process of like, OK, where does it fail? Why does it fail? How do we improve it? Maybe the features aren't good enough in the middle layer, so we can you know, find some way of, of changing the architecture to um, improve those features. Um, and it's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Is it common for each layer to be deliberate and deliberately meaningful? Or um, do they sometimes, you know, have a layer and just let it So I think you can learn a lot um, by looking at the statistics of your input. Um, so for like a visual task, right? Um, you know, you take the power spectrum of the visual image and you get like uh, power, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you, know, you can choose your neural activation <coughs> Functions so that they can like you know pick up um, most of the variance in that signal um, uh, based on those input statistics. So say for audio, it's a little bit different. It's like one over f squared instead of one over f. Or like that. So based on those, you change your activation functions for your neurons. You change the way they're connected. Um, so you can take a, a little bit more principled approach, and I think that's the way to do it: is to look at the statistics of your input um, and your desired output and see like. Know, kind of just reason your way through what would be a good feature kind of 
you see the uh, installation settings for like the end here. Why <coughs> is like putting by like what part of installation by like this like reaching where it now with the smaller I've never I've never seen that. Um, that's an interesting idea. Uh, yeah, I've seen like the like you know the little flex demo and um, I worked on a intelligent dash camera, which is essentially an Android device running neural networks. Um, so um, that's that's as much aesthetic <coughs> stuff as I've seen. Most of my favorite like is data and access and like plugins that I may have on the exploits of machine learning library. I guess it's last year. So, in your slide where you compared um, artificial and biological neural networks, you said that artificial neural networks don't have interests. So, if I try to understand what the implications of that are, do you still have synapses? Do you still have this sort of single output from a neuron that's picked up by a bunch of different connections from other neurons? I think it was just poorly worded. What I meant by that was that um, dendrites in artificial neural networks are just um, you know, passing the signal as it is, whereas dendrites in real brains um, are active computational units. Um, so, for example, there are cells in your retina where the dendrites have an electrical resonance. And so you can give it an uh, electrical input and it'll actually like ring for a long period of time. After. And so you never see that kind of One layer feeds back into a previous layer of that same layer. Um, and that um, has that sort of temporal characteristic, and that didn't solve their task either. Uh, so there's something special about varying the weights quickly um, during the inference step um, that, that gives you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty technical paper. Um, we can talk about it if you want, but um, I don't know. I have to probably reread it a couple of times first. So one thing, this is maybe a really dumb question, if you know, but um, my understanding from this presentation, now I never use machine learning, is that these uh, these connections at each level are uniform. They're homogeneous agents, right? They're like a representative agent. Are there any neural networks or machine learning algorithms that have different types of essentially processing units and that integrate information across the different types of processing units? It's a great question. I, 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 I haven't encountered that. Um, again, like I, I'm not kind of actively researching in this field, so I'm not like as well read as like um, you know some other people. But um, that's a, that's an interesting idea. So there are different types of neurons. So I've been showing mostly like a simple rectified linear unit or something like that. So people have more complicated neurons, but they'll generally make a network that has all the same type of neurons. Layer or each so layer, yeah. Yeah, so within the layer, yeah, generally all the same. Is there a reason for that? Is there a constraint? It's easier to choose. It's the way they've always done it. Calculate all the calculations. Yeah, because if you look at the countries, you can have a space of the pictures. You can have you know, biological layer, you know, yeah. grow some neurons. And then, <laughs> yeah, they, uh, this like trial and error, right? And then yeah. the trials are very 